Okay, uh, welcome everybody also uh, on behalf of Funda. My name is Rule. I work here for about five years and a bit. Uh, quite long for developer standards, I guess. Um, it's so nice to have you here tonight. Uh, I've been coming to CoCats for a few years now, on and off, and now and then. Uh, and I thought like, well, we have this nice place. It's not new anymore. I think it's two years old, three years old now since we've been sitting here. But uh, it's a perfect place to have such a meetup, so why not uh, invite you all over? And of course, I love to present, so I'll do a presentation today for you also. Um, so today I want to talk about testable iOS architectures. Um, um, recently, I've been getting more and more into about how do you test your app, and more importantly, how do you write code that's uh, easily testable? Uh, and I think those two go very much hand in hand, so my presentation will cover a little bit of both of those sides. Um, but first of all, let's talk about why would you test at all? Um, I think, right? You're all developers. Why do we test this? I'm a, per despair, I'm a perfect developer. Everything I do is, is works out of the box and it never breaks, so why should I test? Well, first of all, of course, you want to always improve the stability of your app and make sure that it stays stable over time, right? That's the obvious reason why most of the people uh, test anything uh, nowadays. Um, but other than that, I think, like I mentioned, uh, writing tests can also help you improve the quality of your code. Uh, and that's something that's really underrated. I think that once you start getting seriously into writing tests and unit tests, that it over time automatically improves the quality, the readability, and uh, uh, stability of your code. Uh, and I think finally, the most important thing for me as a developer is that it gives me confidence in the product that I'm building. So uh, as a developer, I want to always like build new stuff, and build cool new features, and have people use those features. But I can only do that if I have confidence on what I built before. So I can only work on a product if I am sure, sure that what I, broke, uh, what I wrote last week, what I broke last week, is it? it's a Freudian slip. Uh, what I wrote last week uh, stays working, so I don't have to worry about that anymore. That anything that I do in the app today will not break something that I built yesterday. So that's gaining confidence. Um, so that's, for me, why I write tests and why I like testing more and more as I grow as a developer, of course. Um, I've been writing... Uh, code for about 15 years now, not on iOS, of course, uh, but uh, I think that's part of maturing as a developer that you start caring more and more about the quality of your code and your product and the stability of it. So that's why I test. I look forward to, look forward to hearing why you test. Um, one thing I do want to note at the start of this presentation is obvious because I'm going to talk a little bit about code coverage, uh, and I think I want to say this beforehand, it's never my idea to test everything of your app, to have 100% coverage of your app. I think that's a myth, uh, first of all. Um, saying that, however, I am going to show you an example of how you can cover as much as your app as possible, um, because it will give you some techniques to uh, uh, test certain things that you might not have thought of, that you could test even. Um, so, what kind of tests are we talking about? There uh, there's like hundreds of thousands of things written about what kind of tests there are. Um, to me, there's only real, really two kinds on the highest level. So I make a distinction between unit testing, and I mean unit testing in, not in a technical sense, as in what you write in Xcode, but as in testing a small part of code that has a very specific uh, functionality. Uh, and on integration testing, which is basically taking more of these uh, parts of code and testing how they collaborate together. That's my simple definition of the kind of test, the test that you have. And there's like a lot of different ways you could uh, implement those tests. So you could write a unit test in Xcode as a unit test. Or uh, I would also define, if I uh, want to do a unit test, I could also do it manually. If I define a certain unit of code as this is how it should perform, I could also just see how that performs in the app manually by tapping on things. So that's how I make a distinction between technically testing and uh, uh, what's actually the high level purpose of what you're trying to test. Um, so getting those two things out of the way, I want to jump as quickly as possible into code and show you uh, um, how to write tests, how I like to write tests. Um, and I have no better way of illustrating how testing should work than with pugs. Um, because I, I was trying very hard to reach for a metaphor here. So first of all, the app I'm going to show you is about pugs. Uh, and second of all, I think pugs are a lot, a lot like our apps. 
is that they are all cute and cuddly on the surface, but they have a lot of problems underneath, right? They have all this inbred DNA, and like, they can barely see, they can barely breathe. So it's a, a really nice uh, analogy of what we normally write as a test, as an app. So I think that you require a lot of testing anyway. Um, so I want to show you a little app that I wrote. Uh, I actually wrote it a couple of years ago already in Objective-C, but I rewrote it for this presentation in Swift. And I'm going to mirror my display so I can also read my own stuff. Mirror display. Uh, yeah, so this is PugMe, uh, an app that I wrote, uh, which was in the store, but it was pulled out by Apple because it was too old, I guess. Um, so now I'm rewriting it to put it back in there because nothing makes more money than cute pictures of dogs. So this is my, like my little, little nest egg that I'm going to make a lot of money on. Um, and I will show you what it does. It's like the most complex app you will ever see. Um, you run it on a simulator when the simulator starts. I should not have killed the simulator before. Yeah. Yeah, it's an old MacBook, yeah. I'm not getting a new one until April, they told me. Yes, here we go. You can do it. This is still the launch screen, so. Yes. So it, uh, it shows a picture of a pug, and then you can tap on the picture, and it shows you a new picture of a pug. And you tap on the picture, uh, you get the idea. So it's like uh, every time you're feeling, feeling a little bit down, you can get rejoiced by opening PugMe and getting a nice picture of an app of a pug. So this is the app that I wrote, and I'm going to show you a little bit on how I wrote it architecturally and how I intend to test it. And I'll walk you through it, a few tests that I'm going to write for this app. So there's obviously a little bit of networking going on. I'm getting these images from Reddit, uh, which has a pug subreddit, and I'm just scraping it and going through all the links and just showing the images that are there, which is, I'm not sure if it's super legal, but I'm doing it anyway. Um, I'm do downloading those images, putting it in an image view. Obviously, some like refreshing going on, uh, progress indicators. There's some error thing handling in it also that if it cannot download the image, it will show you um, a sort of small error on the screen, and you try it again, and then you get a new pug. So uh, it's a pretty simple app, but there's still some logic going on that covers a wide spectrum of uh, uh, possible use cases. Uh, so I wrote a little, made a little architectural thingy here. Um, so this is basically the entire app in a nutshell. There's an image view controller at the top, which is just a view controller with an image view in it. Um, there's an image view present presenter. I'm on purpose not trying to lean towards any specific defined architecture. Uh, so any friends of like MVP, uh, don't worry about it. Any uh, friends of like uh, presenter patterns, don't worry about it. It's my own little architecture thing, yeah? Just all you have to know is that I have a view layer at the top. I have an image view presenter, which handles a little bit of the logic. And then I have some helper classes at the bottom, which are like for getting data and for downloading images. Um, now, as you see, I've wrote down below also which protocols they implement, because I like to work very much with defining my entire architecture as a protocol, um, because it makes it very clear what, a certain, what the purpose is of a certain part of the app. I'm going to show you in code later on how I do that. So all of these things are by basically abstracted by defining it as a protocol instead of a uh, defin definitively as a class. Um, so I'll show you the same setup in Xcode. And the other one, this one. So this is a, a Swift file called Image View Protocols, which define all the protocols that are really used in the app. And I'll show you later on why I'm defining this all in one file, so don't get your uh, panties in a bunch. Um, this is basically all the app does, right? These are all the functionalities of all the clients, of, of all the classes that I'm going to define later on. So I have an image view builder, which is like a little helper class that will help me construct this entire module. I have an uh, image viewing, which is defined as something that can view an image. 
Uh, I have a presenter, which is something that present an image and do some logic on it and handle certain things coming back from the interface, uh, interface layer. I have an image view provider, which is like get me a few images, image URLs, and I have an image downloader, which actually get this, gets this data. So that's the entire app in a nutshell. Um, now I want to walk you through how I'm going to test part of this app, and I'm going to do it in small stages. So I'm going to start with this presenter layer that I'm having, which is actually uh, the biggest part of the app. It has a bit of logic in it. It really defines with how the app actually works. Um, so just a short overview of how this presenter looks. It's, um, let's see if I'm still following my script. Yeah, kind of. So there's a couple of functions here that you saw in the protocol. So it says, uh, down here, implemented this protocol as like a separate extension. So this is a callback that's coming from the view, which says the view loaded. And this is a callback from the view, which says uh, like the user tapped the view. These are callbacks that are coming back to presenter. And then on the image view controller, uh, you can actually see that it's just the bare minimum of what a controller can do. So there's like a view in there. Uh, it has some callbacks. It's calling the presenter here for everything that it does. It automatically goes to the presenter and makes that handle whatever it wants to do. Um, and there are some things that it, this image view controller needs to have uh, the ability to do. So. I want to be able to show an image on this image view controller. I want to show a refresh state, and I want to show an error. I'm on purpose not doing this via uh, view models at the moment, because there might be some instances where you like, um, I, I want to have very fine, fine grain control on what the state is of this view at a certain time. Um, it's more like actions you're taking on the view, not necessarily a state that you're setting at that time, if that makes any sense. So this is like bare minimum. This is all there will ever be in this image view controller. You're showing stuff and you're tapping on it and you're making it come back to the presenter. So what happens if I, uh, let's go to, through one of the use cases. So first of all, when you start the app, obviously this view is loaded. Um, it calls the presenter and it just tells it, okay, I load it, I'm done. Now this presenter is going to do some logic on what should happen when, once this view is loaded. In this case, it will show a refresh state on the view and it will get the next image of a pug. That's the only thing it's going to do. And show you a little bit of the implementation. Get next image, just has some logic like, are there any image uh, URLs that I still have? Otherwise, walk through them. Uh, or just get some new URLs. Uh, and then once I have a new URL, get an image, which actually downloads the image, uh, gets it from data, and it says to the view, show this image. So it's a pretty simple flow of going to the network, coming back, and showing something on the view again. Now I want to talk a little bit about these helper classes that I defined earlier. So as you'll see in this presenter, um, I have these three things here. One is the view, which I told you about. Uh, the other is the image downloader, which will get data for, uh, from an image, for an image from a URL. And it has this thing that can prov provide me with URLs. Uh, now I'm going to, what I did in this pattern at least, is by uh, using dependency injection. So, um, I know the last few years there's been a lot of talk about using traits to add, to add certain functionality to a class, uh, and I like using that a lot too. However, what we're running into more and more in the Finna app also is that once you do this, it becomes harder to do the dependency injection. So normally if I would have this presenter and I want to give, the, give it the ability to download, download an image, I would do just like uh, image downloading, right? But... Um, now, how, I'm going to, how do I want to test this? Because when I'm testing this presenter, I want to test only that code. I do not want to touch anything outside of this class. And uh, as far as I know, as for, uh, the thing I like is to uh, make that distinction by separating, it, uh, by separating the class from the dependencies that it has. And you, do that, you do that by injecting these dependencies once you create the class. So this presenter, we know that it's going to need to download an image. We know that it's going to get some URLs. So as a dependency, we're injecting an image downloading, uh, uh, something that conforms to image downloading, and something that conforms to image URL providing. And I'm using that all the time. Uh, and now I want to show you how I'm going to test this and use this dependency injection to uh, test this whole class, actually. Um, so I have uh, some unit tests defined here. 
Uh, so this is just a normal unit test, uh, test case. Um, and I cheated a little bit by using some snippets. Um, so first of all, let's look at one thing that we want to do here. So this is just some setup that I'll tell you about later. Present to viewed it load. So I told you like once the app loads, it calls back to the presenter and the presenter needs to do something at that time. So the first line of this unit test is, okay, we're going to act on this presenter. This pre presenter is going to be triggered by a viewed it load call. Now at this point is where we made some progress in the last few months or weeks at Funda at least, where we're starting to use, starting to use more and more mocking. Um, you might have noticed, uh, might know this already, and you might not have used it before, but we're using it in a slightly different way that I'm not sure everybody else knows about already. That's why I'm talking about it today. So what we would do previously is we would write uh, a little mocking class, right? Uh, mock image downloader, whatever, that will conform to this protocol. Uh, image downloader. Then you would add an expectation to that, right? When you're writing unit test, and you would say, okay, every time I call view did load on this or uh, get image on this downloader, I would fulfill that expectation, and that's how I would write a unit test, which is very labor intensive because um, this can be automated. And in fact, somebody did already. Somebody who wrote something called Cuckoo. <laughs> who knows of Cuckoo already? Awesome. Nice. So. My presentation just went from like a one hour presentation to like a three hour presentation. So um, what Cuckoo does is, it's actually pretty simple. Cuckoo looks at a certain file in your code base at compile time, uh, and it creates mock mocks for those files or those classes or those protocols automatically during compile time. Um, so this requires some setup, so I'll walk you through it a little bit. So there's my unit test target, I have some build phases, and there's a generate mocks phase in here which runs a script which can be uh, added as a CocoaPod to your uh, project. And you have to define here which files you want to use as input for this uh, Cuckoo program. Uh, and this is actually why I defined all these protocols in one file, because it makes it very much easier to define this right now. So I'm pointing this to, like, uh, to image view protocols, which contains all these protocols that I just showed you, and it's going to create mocks for these things automatically which saves me a lot of time already in the long run. Because most of the, most of the time I write these like half-assed, like I insert one expectation into a mock, I fulfill it on everything that I call, right? That's like the simple way of, okay, something happened on this object and I, it's okay. But well, this actually goes much further than that. So I'll show you what it does. So, yeah, you have to define each file that you want to mock, yeah. Um, so, in this case, uh, there's some setup here, which I'll show you later. So what we actually want to do is we're calling this presenter, and we want to verify that certain things are being called both on the view itself later on and on this helper classes that I have. So I know that if I want to, uh, uh, if the view is loaded, uh, I should get a URL. And if the view is loaded, I should get an image from this image downloader. And all the way in the end, I should show the refresh state, and I should show an image eventually. And this is like pure Cuckoo implementation code. So this mock image URL provider is actually not something I wrote myself. This is defined here, mock image URL providing, which is literally what was generated by Cuckoo. So it's like injected for me uh, automatically on build. And this just acts like it's an image downloader, or it acts like it's a URL provider. And by using verify, you can do what you would previously do with an expectation, making sure that a certain function is called on this mock. So that's saving me a lot of time already in the, in the long run. And you can see that you can verify that this function is called on this mock. And you can see what the parameters are. And I'm, I'm cheating a little bit here uh, by saying uh, get image should be called, and I don't really care with what URL. Just make sure that it's called. Something should happen with this helper class. And in the end, some image should be shown. So you could go even further saying, uh, if I mock uh, the image downloader, I want to make sure that eventually this specific image will be shown on the view. 
But since this app is so simple, I'm going to just assume that that's the case. Um, and then in the end, other than just verifying what happened, you also would like to verify what is not happening. Because for all I know, this view did load function in Representor could do 10 other things that I actually do not want it to do. I want to very specifically uh, uh, structure this test in such a way that it will break if you change any of the behavior of this class. Because that's what a test is, right? It's providing you the assurance that this will work as it was working before, unless you consciously change the behavior of the class. Um, so in this case, I wrote a verify no mocks interactions on all mocks, which is going here. And this is actually a cuckoo function. So I'm saying this image URL provider, it should do nothing anymore. At the, after all of these things are called, it should, do, should not be called anymore on any of the functions in that mock. And the same with all the other mocks here. Am I still making sense now? Who, who's not following along? Any questions? Mm -hmm. is uh, actually verifying the amount of times something yep. is called in one interaction. Okay. That will verify that this is a called exactly twice. Okay. Not more, not less. By default, it's all, all, always one, but you can define what you want. Now, of course, um, this is just verifying that it's called, but there are some functions that you would uh, like to return some actual data in this case. So this presenter is going to get an image URL, but it's not actually going to download that image unless this function would return a real URL. So that's some functionality that I want to uh, stub in this case. So I have this get the image URLs or this mock image URL provider. I'm going to show a little bit at the top here. So this is some setup that I do for every test in this class. Uh, this is again cuckoo code. So I'm going to say like, okay, this mock that I have, I want to fake some behavior on this function that within this mock. So I'm going to say when get image URLs is called with any parameter. I don't really care how it's called. I just want to make sure that every time it's called, it will return a URL, which is new pin to know. Whatever. It could be a real URL. It doesn't really matter at this point. So in this case, it's not really a mock in the sense that it's totally empty and it does nothing. But it's a mock in, I'm going to very specifically say this component is going to behave like this. It's going to return this data and I wanted to, the presenter to, to act on that in a certain way. Uh, and you can go really far with this. So by default, I set most of the stuff to just say, once this function is called, just do nothing. I don't really care about it. But you could make it return actual data. Uh, in this case, for the URL provider, but also here for image downloader. So of course, um, why I wrote this image downloader in the first case is because when you're unit testing, you don't really want to care about networking, right? because I want to be able to run this without any network. Maybe I'm in a train and my network is crappy uh, and I still want my unit test to succeed. So um, I want to mock all of the, these dependencies of the presenter, including the networking layer. So as you saw on my uh, slide earlier, I have this URL session data requester here, which is something I didn't tell you about, but I'm, I wrote this little wrapper around URL session that does nothing other than just get some data from somewhere. And that's all also mockable. So I could mock all of these components at any level. Uh, so I could also write a test for image downloader that says, if my data that I'm getting back from the network is like this, it should not be considered a valid image. So I'm going all the way to the networking layer, all the way to where I really have no control anymore over the functionality itself. Like I'm not going to check whether URL session works. I'm going to assume that somebody at Apple thought about that. So that's the level where I want to stop with testing. Only the stuff that I have control over I want to test. <clears throat> um, so yeah, this was viewed at load. And then I have another sneaky thing here for all the other tests. Not going to through, go through all of them, but uh, yeah, so there's some logic in here. So you can tap the view only once, then a new image is shown, which is the same as when, when it loads, right? That's the same behavior. Um, you can tap it multiple times, and there's some logic in the app that says it cycles through certain images and makes sure you don't see the same bug twice. So it's storing stuff in memory, saying you already saw this bug image and you're not interested in it, in it anymore. And then I'm verifying that if I tap this three times, I want to make sure that three times an image is downloaded, three times a refresh state is shown, three times an image is shown. 
um, error states. So I'm mocking like, okay, this URL provider, it's not going to return any images so or, or any URL. So it's, if it completes and it sends nil, nil data to me, I want to show an error state on the UI. So I'm going to mock this behavior in image URL provider, mock image URL provider. I'm going to act like a touch, touch the screen. And then get image URL should still be called, but after that, it will should show a refresh state, and then it will show an error immediately. And no other behavior should occur, so I'm verifying that no other stuff is happening after this. Is, is the, the order important? No, it no, it's not. So this, this may look weird because this refresh state is actually like here. So first I'm showing refresh state, then I'm doing stuff, and then I'm showing the error. But in this case, the order doesn't, re doesn't really matter. I think you could maybe force that somehow, but I'm just showing, uh, testing that it's, it's doing some stuff. Yeah, you're right, that's a good one. I didn't look into that. Um, so this is a little bit about Cuckoo. So what's the actually test case uh, across it? You know, it's still actually a test case? Or it's, it's still a normal test case, yeah. So what Cuckoo is do doing under the hood is it's creating this, I'll show you. So there's a generated mux.swift, uh, which is pretty big, I think. Oh, it's not too bad, which has these mocks, but also these verify functions that you saw. It's just boilerplate code that is generating for you, right? Um, the nice thing I like about this is that this is, a, uh, this is a standalone thing, so there's no real program running uh, once you run your unit test. This is just Swift code that is generating. So even if Cuckoo dies in the future and nobody's maintaining it anymore, this stuff will still work because it's just code that I checked in into our repo. Um, so that's something about presenter tests, like taking one class, stripping away all its dependencies, mocking those dependencies, and making sure that any kind of input into this class behaves as it should. And that's something I think is very valuable. Um, and uh, again, like I told you before about uh, dependency injection, this really enables that. So um, we're making these mocks here, and image viewing and downloading real providing, and then I'm making a real instance of a presenter, and I'm just passing these things because they're all adhering to the correct protocols. They're all, uh, this is actually an image downloading, and this is actually an image URL providing. So by doing this injection, uh, that actually allows you to decouple that class from its dependencies. And I'm not sure how you could do that with traits because it's, uh, I'm not sure you can. Um, that's something about Cuckoo. Still clear, still with me? Like it, thumbs up, from down. Yeah. yeah, nice. So hopefully that's already useful for you. Uh, I won't dive too, too deep into this because it goes very deep. And there's some gotchas here and there, but you'll figure it out. It's the, the, the documentation is very good. It's a pretty new project. I think it's only uh, maybe a couple of months old. Uh, so it's not super old, um, but it has a few maintainers and it's like, it's useful in itself already, so why not use it, I guess? Is that useful? Sorry? Useful? Yeah, so we are using it, yeah. yeah. So there's at least one big user of this library, yeah. <laughs> you shouldn't have prepared to take over the project. <laughs> 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 now we're going to do like the async display kit where we're just ha handing it over between companies. Like, you're now the maintainer of this. Um, <laughs> I think you can add folders here, maybe, yeah. What you could also do is, this is just a shell script, so if you have any other way of uh, defining this, like you could maybe prefix certain Swiss files with a certain uh, right. should mock uh, before it, then just search on that and inject that into the shell script. You can go as far as you want with scripting it yourself, but this is... It's like it's going short really. short Sorry? Really does that as well, it's yeah. Based on templates and then yeah. Mm. Yeah, because this is a little bit cumbersome, I, I agree, yeah. It's, but uh, as long as you define it like this, it becomes less cumbersome. So it's not, if it's not like one protocol per file, then it's easy to do. Your mileage may vary. Um, so that's something about Cuckoo. I wanted to talk about another thing that maybe not everybody's doing yet, which is snapshot testing. Um, 
So I like to write as much unit tests as possible, and I despise UI testing uh, because it's slow and cumbersome and it will break every time you do not want it to break. My experiences with it are not super positive, as you might uh, notice. Um, so I would like to go as far as much as, as far as possible with unit testing. And I think snapshot testing nicely bridges the gap between what's happening in the backend code of your app and what's uh, actually shown on the screen. So who has not used snapshot testing before? Uh, a couple of hands. Um, where this one? So this is the image view controller. An image view controller should be pretty dumb, right? It's saying, show me this image and it should be shown on the screen or uh, set the refresh state or set the error state. Those are all states that you could measure and they're pretty dumb, like they're not automating or anything like that. So um, what did I call this image? No, what's it called? Uh, I lost my code snippet name, sorry. <laughs> Snap, yeah, obviously. Um, so this is a snapshot test case for who, for the people who have not used it before. So this is once again a CocoaPod that you could use in your product, a project. Uh, this does change the test case, so it's a speci specific FB snapshot test case, even though it's not owned by Facebook anymore, but Uber is maintaining it now, so there's still a big company behind it, but it's just, they just handed it over. Um, what snapshot test case does, and I know there are a lot of other tools that can do this also, uh, new ones come by every day, I think, is it's taking a view, any kind of view, it's making an image out of that at that specific point of time, it's storing that image on disk, and then every time this test is run, because this is still just a normal unit test under the hood, it's verifying this image that it creates at that moment with the image that it already had on disk to make sure that it's pixel by pixel the same image as you had before. Uh, so that looks like this, right? If I have a refresh state, I'm creating an image view controller, a real instance, I'm not mocking anything. I'm saying you should show refresh state at this time. And then saying snapshot verify the view of this view controller. So when I run, run this, there are two ways of running this. If you say record mode is true, it will generate this image, which should be like a one-time thing, or every time you change a little bit of how this uh, application works. I type some magical code here, yeah. right? Oh yeah. Hopefully this is faster than before. Boop. It's failing now, this test, because it wants to warn me like, hey, you ran in record mode and I cannot verify anything. So it now says false. And I'll show you on disk. Um, where is this? I'm just going to do it like this. So this automatically creates a directory here, reference images 64 bits. Uh, it names a folder with the same name as your test class, uh, this one, and it creates an image in there and you'll see that this is the actual view of the refresh state. Uh, and then when I run it again, in record mode is false, it will verify that state. I think it runs it like at ex exact time. It works, so. <laughs> yeah, but it starts animating right away also, so it's, it's a good question. I don't know how fast it starts. Maybe this is, a, maybe I wrote a flaky test here. Could be. Um, Yeah, so it makes a, you should run snapshot tests on a, a certain device, and that's always the device that you want to run your snapshot test on. That's slightly annoying. You could run it for all the devices that you want to test on, but it will store separate images for every device size. So what we're using at Funda more is, in this case, I'm testing the entire view controller, but we're using it in Funda more to test very specific parts of the view. So if I have a house on the result list of, uh, in the Funda app, I want to make sure that this one line looks like this, and that's screen size independent. So it doesn't really matter if it's 
this size or this size, this small component on the screen should always have this state. Uh, Good for testing the state, the screen state, but not layout. Uh, well, if you run it like this, it's still testing layout. So if you want to handle it. No, no, no. Yeah. So if you we use it more to test individual components on the screen than the layout of those components, that's true. Yeah. You could, but it might be, become a little bit cumbersome if you're running it on 20 different types of devices and screen sizes. Nimble has a wrapper on the snapshot testing where you can't just cache a different state selection and it will run a different size of These other ones are exactly the same as the one you saw before, except here, uh, is this interesting? No, not really. So these are the three things you could do with a view controller, right? Show the error state or test, uh, or show an image on there, and I'm just loading an image from disk that's in the test bundle, show this image so it's always the same, and I'm running a snapshot test on that. So now I've verified these three cases. And I verified in my presenter that switching between this, those three cases actually works. So, in my opinion, I've now tested basically from the UI to the logic layer, and even further than that, because I'm also testing the data layer itself or the networking layer. So this is as far as I would go with coverage of these, this app. Um, and that's basically it, all I wanted to show you. Any questions about this? Do you like it? Are you going to use it? Anybody who hasn't used it who's like, ah, pretty cool? Yeah, cuckoo. Oh, I don't know. It's quite a steep learning curve, I would say. What's yeah. your with that? The nice thing is that, um, I didn't talk about this yet, but cuckoo is actually based on uh, something that's from the Android world, which is called Mokito, which is doing the same thing, except slightly smarter, because they have the ability to do like inspection, and they don't have to do it uh, compile time. They can do it runtime and automatically mock stuff there. So that's slightly uh, smarter. but uh, the entire syntax is the same. So once you learn this kind of stuff, you also have Mokido knowledge. And I think that's going towards a certain standard, standard on mocking things and verifying that certain things are called. All of them look quite similar. So I think it's a steep learning curve, but it's worth it, I think, in the long run. Um, because we're now testing stuff that we couldn't test in any, any other way, or by writing a lot of mocking stuff ourselves, which we do not really want to do. So I think it's worth it, but it's up to you. Yeah. So are there things that you currently cannot test with Google? Uh, generics, how does it work with that? Yeah, so it doesn't, doesn't do generics, that's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't do uh, structs, so you cannot mock a struct. But, um, Yeah, I don't know. They said it was on their backlog, but I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, so you do not have a reference to this object anymore. It just becomes a new struct. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So there are a couple of those things, but they're, they're really well documented on their Cuckoo page on GitHub. Where they say, like, yeah, this is not supported yet. To be honest, I didn't see any cases, and I haven't seen any cases so far in the Funda app either, where we're like, oh, yeah, we really cannot do this. There are some cases that we're like, yeah, we, do we really want to go as far as testing this? Like I said, most of the cases were just testing whether certain things are called, not what all the parameters are that they are called with, uh, which is just a personal thing that you might want to do, yes or no. But you can if you want. Uh, so I think as long as you base stuff on protocols, <laughs> this is like uh, Apple 101, do everything with protocols and everything will be fine. <laughs> so there's one test which verifies that there is no other interaction happening in the end. Right? Yeah. Is that like a timeout waiting for a certain amount of time that there is nothing coming in? Or does that work underneath? I think, I'm assuming, I didn't go this deep into it, that underneath it's all expectations. So I'm going to think that once this happens, um, yeah, that's a good one. I'm not sure how it handles asynchronous stuff. Yeah, so I mean that you check now, there's nothing happened after, but what if after that, still something is happening, right? 
No, I don't know. That's at least something you run into with asynchronous stuff. stuff. Yeah. What? What? Yeah, so I was leaning to that also, like what's the stuff that's normally asynchronous, networking layers, uh, things like that. Yeah. And if you mock all of those things, they're basically synchronous because they're so fast and they're instantaneous that they're not really asynchronous anymore. Yeah, yeah but you still have to handle the, the completion block. Yeah, and but that's what I'm doing here. So if I, for instance here, this is an asynchronous call, right? So this is an image URL getter, which goes to the network and which goes to a Reddit client, which I wrote. But in the end, if I call this immediately, it's really not asynchronous anymore because this is all happening on the main thread. Still testing yeah. So that's good. Yeah. So in general, I would say do not make your unit test dependent on asynchronous code. Maybe utopia, uh, but... Uh, <laughs> You mean if I would do this? Yeah. Yeah, so this comes back to your earlier question about order. I'm not yeah. sure when it's checking which one. Exactly. I'm going to say that, I'm going to assume that this is an assumption that at this time it will fail already because it says, I'm checking the state at this moment and uh, show error is called, but you have not verified yet that it's called. So you, like, you have to make sure that you verify everything that's happening yeah, okay, yeah. So if I would not do this, it would complain also saying, and it will actually give a quite an explicit error message uh, when it fills the test. It will say, you did not want any interactions anymore on any Mac mocks, but show error was called on mock view. And this could be an unintended side effect of what your presenter is doing. So that's actually what you want. If I accidentally add this call in the presenter, you want to make sure that your tests change in that space. It's an error, yeah. Could you compete with it? I don't know. I'm such a bad presenter, sorry. Oh, yeah. more than next, next month in November, I'll uh, do it again and then. Uh, <laughs> How is the uh, complexity scale up? I mean, I think that on the average, uh, quite a bit more complex. You mean complexity as in with Cuckoo or in general? Yeah, Uh, my experience is that any time the tests get too complex, that the code that I'm writing is probably too complex too. So if this presenter tests class becomes too big, then that's a code smell for me that I would maybe split this off into helper classes or any kind of other logic classes that I can then test separately. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so we, we're running into some parts of it. For instance, uh, I cannot show you this or maybe I can. No, that's too much for now. So we're building this uh, drawer logic in uh, the map on Funda, where if you're looking at a house, you can also see which supermarkets are near it and stuff, which is based on like the go how the Google Maps does drawers, where you can select categories of po points of interest that you want to see, which is quite some complex logic. Right now, we have a presenter that says like, present the map, uh, but we're also doing all the drawer stuff on that which is a logical thing to maybe split off. Maybe we want a presenter that only handles uh, uh, the drawer logic, and then we test that. So that's a use case where it's start slowly starting to build. But yeah, that again, that's not uh, a result of the test being too complex. It's a result of the code being too complex, I would say. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. Other questions? I see people clapping. Uh, we've had an issue lately, but only last two weeks or so, where um, it broke when we upgraded to Xcode 10. <laughs> oh, you were pointing to that? <laughs> Which I think is a known issue, and we're, we actually reverted back to Xcode 9 on our environment because it was so painful. For some reason, the snapshots changed when you switched to Xcode versions, which makes no sense at all. Like it was made anti aliasing things, maybe, or something? We had an issue where it was uh, just kind of rendering things a little differently because the drop shadows or something. Yeah. Like yeah. 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 Although our experience is we just have to regenerate everything. Yeah. 
Once yeah. You get it, then you actually yeah, and we're adding it now too because, like you said, like you saw before, where you have to do this record mode is true, and then you can do it per class or you can do it per test. And we had it set per test, but now you, when you run into like, oh yeah, I want to recreate all of these snapshots, uh, snapshots for like hundreds of tests, then you maybe want to have a global setting that can do that instead of doing it individually. So, so we made it a runtime variable that gets something yeah. in a special class and then That's every what test has this set up. Uh, yeah. Record mode is should record. Blah, blah, or this, yeah. yeah. That's what we're doing now too. And of, obviously, that's a danger in itself also a little bit because you're generating these snapshot tests but for all you, uh, or these snapshots, but for all you know, something is seriously wrong with an upgrade. So you still want to like manually check is this an actual failure or is this just Xcode being weird and rendering stuff different on a certain simulator? Well, you have rock, paper, yeah. rock, paper, scissors? You are screwed. You check the disk. Oh, <laughs> you have a Corvée uh, thing that you pass around. It's like, you should now test the snapshots. Yeah. So how is this better than UI testing? Because I don't use snapshots. It's faster. So it's still a unit test, right? It doesn't, it doesn't actually do something in the app itself. It doesn't. No, I, I agree, yeah. Mm. Like most of my test failures with snapshot, snapshots have been not actual failures, but mm. that costs a lot of time because you do have to go through the issues mm. that. I think, and, and honestly, yeah. it's just seeing from React where they actually store like the actual HTML instead of a screenshot, which is the exact same thing. Like you upgrade the React version, and all of a sudden there's spaces where there weren't spaces before, and yeah. your snapshot tests fail. Yeah. Because they change their rendering to not remove space. Yeah. 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 I think other than the case we have now with like it randomly breaking uh, when we upgrade to Xcode, um, our experiences have been more positive than that. Um, I think also we've had some cases where it, where it was very valuable to us, like oh, certain suddenly we have this text that renders bold instead of it renders like a normal font, which was very useful to us. We, we, we would have never caught otherwise. So these, especially these subtle changes in how stuff renders, that's actually what you want to fill on a snapshot test. And it's annoying that outside things influence that. Yeah, I, I agree on that, but um, it's still useful to us. And it's more maintainable, I will say, at the moment still than running UI tests. And it's instant, so that's very useful also. You can run it as a developer without waiting on it. That's nice. Yeah. Is it also, I'm not too familiar with UI testing, but is it also a benefit that you can just spawn a view that you would normally have to uh, tap around a lot to... to yeah. I don't know if you can do that with UI testing as well. But. Well, you have to, uh, you, I'm not sure. Can you do that with UI testing? Like step into a certain part of the app? Yeah, which is kind of what a UI test is for, right? So the, the one thing you're missing in this kind of testing now is the flow from tapping on a screen and moving to a different screen. We've actually written some tests in the Fun app also that also test that part. So we have like routing classes that say, once you tap this button, it should spawn a new view controller, which should be this view controller, which we then test separately. So you have the entire transition from one screen to the other, which is possible if you just have pretty simple screens. But if you have harder interaction than that, it becomes pretty tricky. Uh, but yeah, in this case, we're testing things that are way deep down in the app uh, as, a, as a view only, which, yeah, you would have to click around a lot to get there in a UI test. Yeah. And also, like, maintenance of the, of the, of the simulator stuff is also, it's pretty independent of what simulator it runs on when you build, uh, test the uh, views themselves, at least. Whereas on a UI test, you might like uh, update your CI environment and suddenly it doesn't run anymore because, I don't know, some button changed or it doesn't run on Xcode 12 anymore, but on something else. And it feels a little bit less flaky than a UI test to me. Yeah. And you can mock here, right? Where UI tests are not mockable, it's easy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we've done that before too. We, we, we had some instances where we wanted to maybe 
do UI testing. So we started with UI testing in the Vanda app, but still wanted to mock certain things like networking layers. So every time I open the app, I want to have the same exact result list, for instance, for screenshotting or something like that. Um, and then you're passing launch variables to it and saying, oh yeah, if these launch variables are there, then the co uh, I actually don't create this downloading class, but I create this mock downloading class, which is done like basically testing code that's living in your real code base, which is not very nice. Um, so yeah, that's still something you all have to bridge, I think. Mocking in while it's running is something that's nice and would be nice for screenshotting, but that's not solved by this. No. Did you ever investigate in doing UI testing with unit testing? And with that, I mean that actually clicking through queues with unit testing, like you know, with the KAS or something like that. No, I've never used that before. Most of we, we've, yeah. I think as, as long as you make your views, your views simple enough so that they respond to a certain event and immediately pass it off to a certain class that can handle that event, the risk of uh, this button breaking because it doesn't uh, point to the right target in the class or something like that, the right selector, that's, I think, a risk I would be willing to take without testing. it. So if I, like here in my test, say, I tapped on the view in a unit test, I'm going to assume that everything that happens before that is actually like pretty solid. And if you assume, make that assumption, then UI testing becomes not really necessary anymore, I would say. No questions anymore? Okay, thanks a lot for your attention. Thanks for being here tonight. <laughs>